So at this time, I'd like to invite my colleague and the founder of My Dog is My Home, Christine Kim, to co-moderate the next keynote session with me. Christine, welcome to the virtual spotlight. Thank you, Carol. Am I coming in loud and clear? Yes, you are. All right, great. No issues right now. <laughs> Well, it's a pleasure to join you for our next and last keynote of the conference. But before we begin that, I um, do want to give everyone an update on Marilu and um, her dog, Migizi, which she mentioned during yesterday's keynote. Um, she said that her dog, Migizi, is doing much better today. Oh, and she really does feel that the positive thoughts that we all sent her during yesterday's keynote really helped. And so, um, I would like to request that everyone do the same thing today and send loving and healing thoughts and feelings to uh, Marilu and Megazi. I got goosebumps. I'm not used to good news these days. And I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, I'm going to start sobbing. So yay. Yes. yes. Okay. So this year's conference theme, Stronger Together, Building Allyship Between Movements, is a recognition that closing the gap in services for people experiencing homelessness with companion animals is as much of a concrete logistical challenge as it is a symbolic one. The problem may seem narrow in the scope of all the social issues we are facing, but we must widen the understanding of what this problem is. It is about all of us and it is about everything. Through this conference and our keynotes, we are honoring the complexity of the problem at hand. To really understand homelessness, we need to understand what drives it now and in the future, including climate related disasters um, and displacement. We need every solution and every solver. These times we live in call for the full spectrum of voices and insights for how we can create change. To quote the Honorable Ruth Bader Ginsburg, fight for the things you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. To explore our mission within an existing framework that brings individual voices and social issues together to create collective change, we have dedicated our last keynote to the Grand Challenges. The Grand Challenges keynote panel will highlight the overall framework used to identify and tackle the most critical social issues facing our country. Leaders brought together through this national initiative recognize that each area is distinct yet connected and that the success of each movement is interdependent on the success of all others. This keynote panel is a call to action for all of us to work together to tackle these problems. Climate, animal welfare, and homeless advocates are invited to join each other's movements in the struggle for a more just society for all. That's definitely a tall order, isn't it? No pressure on the presenters, but in all seriousness, we have three brilliant people with us today Dr. Benjamin Henwood from University of Southern California, Junmo Kang from Washington University in St. Louis, and Dr. Daniel Brisson from University of Denver. Presenting first, we have Dr. Benjamin Henwood, a recognized expert in health and housing services research whose work connects clinical interventions with social policy. Dr. Henwood has specific expertise in improving care for adults experiencing homelessness and serious mental illness as well as in the integration of primary and behavioral health care. His research has been funded by the National Institutes of Health, including um, the National Institute of Mental Health, National Institute on Drug Abuse, and National Institute on Aging, the National Science Foundation, and the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. He has served as the methodological lead for the Greater Los Angeles Homeless Count since 2017, which is the largest unsheltered count in the country. He's the co-author of a book on Housing First published by Oxford University Press and is the co-lead of the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare's uh, Grand Challenge to End Homelessness. Dr. Henwood is a professor at the University of Southern California. Uh, Suzanne Dvorak, I'm so sorry for betraying that peck, School of Social Work and the director of the Center for Housing, Homelessness and Health Equity Research. Dr. Henwood, welcome and thank you for being with us today. Uh, when you're ready, please begin. Great, well, th thank you so much for, uh, for that introduction and I'm happy to be here, part of the conference. It's been a great conference. I was able to join yesterday to talk um, very specifically about what we found in terms of the prevalence of pet uh, companionship ownership among our unsheltered population uh, here in Los Angeles. And so for those of you who missed it, 
you know, we've seen on kind of looking at our representative sample that between nine and 12% of our unsheltered population, adult population identified as uh, having a, a companion uh, while, while out on the streets. Um, but I, I'll actually, I'll go ahead and pull up some slides real quick. Um, and hopefully everyone can see. Let me just begin the slideshow. Okay. If you can't see that, let me know. Otherwise, I'll assume that you can. Um, okay, so I think before before I get into it, right, so yesterday was very specific uh, about prevalence of pet ownership. Today, you know, kind of broadening out the conversation a little bit to social work, grand challenge to end homelessness. So I feel like two ends of the spectrum, maybe. Um, and, and I want to, I want to, tell you a little bit about what the grand challenges are for people who aren't familiar. Uh, but before, before I do that, just to give a little bit of background and, and thanks again for the introduction, but you know, I've, I've been trained as a clinical social worker um, out at NYU. And um, most of my work has always been in the field of homelessness and housing. And uh, I, I did a lot of work um, within housing first programs. And actually my early on, one of the needs that I identified was when our- Dedicated assistance, magic oh, assistance. Sorry, I don't know what that was, but um, you know, when any of our tenants would end up in the hospital, you know, several of them had pets and we weren't sure, um, you know, well, what, how, how do we handle this as a housing agency? So we actually partnered with a local vet. Um, this was in Brooklyn and um, did some work together. And, and so anyway, we, uh, I ended up being a founding member of SWAHAB, which is a, an official um, social work NASW uh, interest group that stands for the Social Workers for the Advancement of the Human Animal Bond. Um, I, I haven't worked with them in quite some time. I, I assume that they're still active and maybe some people even here are affiliated with them. So, so anyway, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. So I'm really happy to, to be here today. Um, ultimately, after, after working in Housing First, I, I ended up in, in academia and I've been out at USC since 2012 um, and working on, on uh, homelessness issues out here. So with that as an introduction, let me uh, go ahead and talk, talk a little bit about the grand challenges. So in, in 2015, the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare they put out a call for grand challenges. They were supposed to represent an, an ambitious social agenda um, for the profession, for the social work profession. And you know, part of the idea was to get people both within and outside the pre profession, you know, reinvigorated or excited about a lot of these issues in a different way uh, by framing it as a grand challenge. Uh, the idea was really based on other disciplines have done this in, in particular, the field of engineering had a grand challenge initiative. Um, and they, they actually had an explicit goal of kind of reinventing their profession in order to, in order to attract, um, attract a, a different pool of students in, into the field. So to, to, in order to entice more women, and more uh, BIPOC community members to, to become engineers. And so part of the way they were able to do that is to redefine what they work on as a, as a field, as a profession. And so just to give you some examples, some of their grand challenges is included, you know, clean water for everyone, um, enhanced personalized learning, uh, as well as virtual reality. So things that you might not traditionally think of when you think of the field of engineering, they sort of put themselves out there um, as a way to help excite people about, about their profession, the work they do. So social work had similar aspirations to that. They, they also wanted to kind of launch, have a very you know, proactive social agenda that they could point to, but also to get people excited. Uh, and in order to do that, they had basically just had an open call where people could write in what they think the, cha the grand challenges should be for, for social work. And so, um, a group of us, um, our team here, went ahead and we submitted um, a grand challenge on on ending homelessness. And so you can see my my colleagues here um, who were part of that initial effort. It also included um, uh, Philip Mangano, who used to be the um, 
uh, head of the Interagency Council on, on Ending Homelessness. And, and so he partnered. So we were trying to get, you know, not, not just within the field, but, but people from outside the field to talk about this. And, um, you know, initially, actually, our grand challenge focused on ending chronic homelessness. And the American Academy came back and, and said, you know, we would, we would like it to be broader uh, to include all of homelessness. And so we, we try to expand that. Um, and I think the, the reason I bring that up is because I think that'll be important for where we are today in terms of what defining these uh, grand challenges. So we were selected, our, our paper was selected as one of 12 initial grand challenges. And you can see the other ones down here that are grouped into kind of three different buckets um, of individual and family well-being, uh, stronger and social, stronger social fabric, and a just society. And you know, you can take a look for yourself, but you know, we have other grand challenges that that again align very much with the social work profession. Um, you know, like addressing health disparities and um, and smart decarceration is another very active challenge. Um, but then we have some that you know weren't as as straightforward, such as harnessing technology for social good. Um, and and I and the one I want to point out actually is eliminating racism was not an initial um, was not an initial grand challenge. And there was a lot of discussion about that. And part of the thinking was that, well, really, you know, there were some issues that cut across a lot, lot of the grand challenges. And so there was decision not to include, to call out racism in particular. I think in hindsight, the, you know, the view was that that was pro probably a mistake. And so as of last year, that was officially, um, um, elevated as as one of one of the grand challenges. So there there are thirteen now. Okay, so let me go ahead and talk a little bit about um, our grand challenge on ending homelessness. So, you know, the uh, what initially was just a paper and an agenda sort of became an initiative. But like like a lot of these initiatives, are, it's an unfunded kind of mandate. You know, they asked uh, uh, myself and and Deborah Paget to sort of be accountable. Um, to to the leadership board to to push the grand challenges along, but what I wanted to really highlight was the idea that this was really supposed to be a decentralized initiative. And what I mean by that is, while you know we sort of have this um, this as a social agenda, um, any the idea the thinking behind this was you know let a let a thousand flowers bloom, which basically is just anyone who's doing work who's inspired by the grand challenges. Who wants to, um, you know, to to move their work forward under the auspices of the grand challenges can can go ahead and do so. And they don't need permission. They don't need to check out check in with anybody. So it is very decentralized in that way. So there are plenty of things happening related to the grand challenges on ending homelessness that you know I, I'm not aware of. I don't know of, and that and that's by design. Uh, which is not to say that that our initiative doesn't also have some things that that we that we do um, that that we do work on more centrally, and I'll, I'll talk about that that as well. So, for just as an example, you know, we we there are two textbooks that have been published on the grand challenges when they first started. We just there's another one that's uh, just came out this month, which was really an update of all the grand challenges and where they are after five years into the initiative. So, you know, needing someone who's going to respond to those requests to write those things, that's uh, somewhat, you know, the, the role that we play as leads. Um, so just to kind of give you an example, so, uh, you know, of the decentralized um, uh, design of, of the social work grant challenges is that there, you know, the National um, Center on uh, Excellence and Homeless Services that's out of the University of Albany that's um, run by Heather Larkin, uh, they, they try to organize schools of social work across the country to infuse more, um, more curriculum on homelessness, to try to get field placements more targeted um, and innovative around this issue. And so um, they really took up the grant, the grand challenge to end homelessness and, and created this national um, homeless social work initiative. And that's really you know, that comes out of a lot of the schools. I know at our school at USC, we have a doctorate in social work program that now when people come in, they have to identify which social work grand challenge they want to work on. That's part of the, you know, the curriculum. Um, some schools have hosted conferences 
Um, I was lucky enough to be asked actually by our next presenter, Dan, Dan Brisson, to be part of University of Denver's um, uh, colloquium on, on the grand challenges a, a few years back. So this is just to kind of give you an example of there's, there's lots going on out there. A lot of it is kind of based in academic settings around the grand challenges, just to give you a sense of the work that's, that's going on. But but which is not to say that we're not focused on on policy issues and and trying to advance these more systematically. So, um, actually, uh, with the 2020 election in in, in January of 2020, we did put out a, a set of policy proposals. We got experts from across uh, the field and the country to you know address different issues and to try to raise awareness of of ending homelessness as part of the. Uh, presidential debate. Um, we, we did have some success. Unfortunately, that this came out uh, in in January of 2020 um, and sort of the pandemic uh, in a lot of ways um, took center stage um, thereafter. But but these are the kinds of things that, you know, we work on as part of the grand challenges. Okay, so I think, you know, one one thing I just want to point out is we've been working on this for quite some time, but there's a lot of indication that we're not making progress, right? And I just wanted to touch base with um, what's going on here in Los Angeles, where we've seen an 85% increase in our um, uh, homeless population over the past 10 years. Um, and so I think that that in of itself can be very discouraging, right? And so in terms of like updating, like how are we doing on the grand challenges? I think just to be, be mindful of that. Um, there's been a lot of pushback on, on you know, policies that we know work and programs we know work, um, such as Housing First. That's, you know, our the previous administration was was thinking Housing Fourth made more sense. And so I think, you know, there, there are real cause for concern in terms of how things are going. I think one thing I wanted to point out is as much as people point to these rising numbers as you know as the what we're doing is not working i think what's what's not really accounted for is if we didn't like so for instance in los angeles we've we've done a lot in terms of trying to address homelessness the taxpayers have passed a a huge initiative a 1.2 billion dollar bond to create housing um and you know, so I think the question is, you know, what's that delta? If we if we weren't doing everything we're doing, what would the numbers actually be? And so I think I think sometimes that can be a little bit misleading in terms of what, what work is actually getting done. But I wanted to kind of return a little bit more to you know that that issue um, and the problems we face in terms of how we are currently defining the grand challenges, ending all of homelessness. Right? I think earlier we talked about. You know, we talked about um, initially it was focused on ending chronic homelessness, but then it was brought into all, all of homelessness and sort of the implications of that. And I, I think what I, I wanted to point out, um, and, and in some ways this is in, uh, uh, in order to transition over to some of our other speakers today, but, you know, I think one of the main questions is we, we have a lot of these discrete, the discrete grand challenges. And the question is, you know, can you really solve one without solving multiple at the same time? We know that, you know, racism kind of underlies much of what we see in the problems of um, homelessness and, and uh, incarceration rates. And so, you know, how can you, can, can you address ending homelessness without also uh, addressing uh, eliminating racism and issues around smart incarceration? I know that you know, inequality has gotten worse since we began the grand challenges um, nationally, and we see that's related to rates of so, um, to rates of homelessness across the country. So, you know, in order to address homelessness, it also means we need to address inequality. Um, I think, you know, to the issue, you know, around climate change, which is one of the grand challenges, we know, you know, that the direction of our our climate and global warming is going in such a way that we can predict many people are gonna be displaced from their homes and become homelessness because of that displacement. So climate change then becomes connected to this grand challenge of homelessness. Um, and I think the point is right again, that in order to really address any of these, we're gonna to have to think of 
think of them collectively. And we'll, we'll need to figure out ways to innovate in order to, to get that work done. And so I think that that really was meant my framing to say, you know, the two things that I think our next speakers are going to talk about, which is to delve in these questions right around how the grand challenge of ending homelessness might connect with some of these other ones in particular and give you examples of that. And then also in the space, the need for innovation. And I think we'll have time for discussion. So I'm just going to leave my comments at, at, at um, for, for now at this point, and then happy to take any, any questions as as you'd like. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Henwood. I appreciate your time um, and thank you for being here with us. There will be a Q&A at the end with all of our speakers. Uh, so folks continue to put your questions and comments in the chat and we will save them for the Q&A at the end. Our next presenter is Junmo Kang. Junmo, a PhD, Junmo is a PhD candidate in social work at the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis. Junmo's scholarship focuses on environmental justice and social vulnerability. His research interests are twofold. One, social vulnerability and resilience of marginalized communities to climate change related disasters. And two, the role of social work practice and policy to support and advocate for, for vulnerable groups affected by the changing natural environment. His dissertation, The Vulnerability of a Poor Urban Neighborhood to Extreme Weather and Disasters and the Role of Eco-Social Work, is an ethnography on the vulnerability of one of the most impoverished communities in Seoul, Korea to disasters. Junmo, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Whenever you are ready, you may begin. Thank you, Christine. Uh, let me start with sharing the screen first. Uh, can you all see the screen? Um, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jun Mo. My pronouns are he, him, and his. Uh, I'm currently a PhD candidate at WashU. Um, so my, as Christine mentioned, I do research around climate justice. And all, recently, I've been focused, also focusing on uh, people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, so let me just, yeah, today, so I'd like to start by just talking about the connection between climate change and the field of social work. So some of you might recognize this tweet um, that went viral uh, last fall uh, when Hurricane Ida hit New York. Um, in this tweet, um, you can see that a hooded delivery man wading through wasty water um, clutching someone's takeout order in a white plastic bag. And Hurricane Ida was a natural disaster that affected everyone uh, living in New York. But even when it affected everyone, as this tweet shows, some were obviously more in danger and some were more impacted than others. So I think we have to ask the question of why. Uh, why do some people have to risk their lives delivering food amidst a hurricane, whereas some people have the luxury of not having to worry about their dinner even during a hurricane? Um, and I think it's simple. It's because, you know, food delivery companies offer extra money to delivery drivers uh, when the demand is high. And it's obvious that some drivers have to think about working to make the ends meet and risk their health and safety. Um, so I think this example shows that how, just how current social injustice, whether that's economic disparity, racism, poverty, homelessness, it's all closely linked to, you know, climate, environment-related disasters. So in that sense, um, even though, the hurricane was a natural disaster. In a way, it was a socially created disaster. So this is why um, I think climate justice is really related to, closely related, linked to social work. It's because uh, many communities of color, indigenous, immigrant, low-income communities across the country are unevenly exposed to you know, environmental and climate injustices. So I, I really feel like social justice is at the heart of all climate, environmental, um, and, and climate issues which is why um, one of the 12 original grand challenges is, is creating a social response to a changing environment. So when this group was first created, a group of uh, social work scholars called for our field of social work to engage in a variety of activities that would advance this grand challenge and ignite um, social work practice, policy, and research to focus on disaster risk reduction, environmentally displaced populations, uh, community adaptation and resilience to environmental change and environmental justice. And um, the original grand challenges actually suggested three policy recommendations that social work should focus on. Um, 
And, and because social work is so uniquely positioned to address these issues, uh, you know, through promoting justice, equity, human and social development, you know, through its uh, person and environment oriented policies, um, and practice. I think social work advocacy for climate justice has grown in recent years. For example, um, in 2020, the, the CSWE, which is a Council on Social Work Education, they adopted a curricular guide for environmental justice. Um, there are also efforts to develop ecologically sustainable welfare practices and policies. Um, however, despite all these efforts, I think research on climate change is still very, it re still remains a very small subfield in, in social work, which is why one of the leading figures um, in social work research, uh, her name's Dr. Lisa Rafe Mason, who's from the University of Denver. Um, she called for social work. She called for, for social workers and social work researchers to, to, you know, the future is to connect the dots for how, you know, climate change intersects with, you know, ranges of areas of work, you know, engage in dialogue across differences you know, to, to build an alliance, uh, which actually brings to the research that I do. So one of the uh, research topics that I'm interested in is the intersection between homelessness and climate change. Uh, this is because those who are experiencing homelessness are by definition, the most exposed to weather conditions and the social and economic problems caused by extreme weather and climate change and variability. So if you look at previous literature, um, like research, it clearly argues that climate change will be more devastating, especially for folks who are unhoused and experiencing homelessness. So today I want to briefly um, share one of my recent research, which is a case study on extreme weather disasters and, and, and its impact on the urban poor in South Korea. So this work actually focuses on people living in informal settlements called a chokbang in, in Seoul, Korea, which are these illegally operated micro units that are on on average about you know 18 to 70 square feet. So these are probably smaller than a standard walk-in closet in America. And um, the word jokbang, these this actually literally translates as, as like sliced rooms because they're they're sliced, they're they're illegally partitioned. Um, and these micro units do not have a separate kitchen, shower, bathroom. And residents often share like a toilet and a faucet, you know, to shower and wash. Um, and this is what a typical these like micro units look like. Um, the one in the middle is like a drawing, and people, you know, have very small space. They just like have just enough space to just lie down um, with very few belongings. And in 2019, the UN Human Rights Council wrote a special report on informal settlements in Korea and wrote that. You know, some were so small that tenants had to sleep sitting up or in a bent position. And also, you know, when rainwater pour into these rooms, residents are in a weak position to, to demand repairs. So otherwise, they risk losing their rooms and have no alternative accom accommodation. So, so these rooms are probably the last housing to folks who are on the verge of becoming unhoused. And for those of you who might have seen the, the Korean movie Parasite um, that came out a few years ago. So the New York Times did a report on... Korea's uh, most poor living in these basement apartments, like the one in the movie. And the article wrote that um, those who lived in these basement apartments actually fear that they would end up living in these micro units because that's where people end up dying alone. So in fact, these, uh, because these micro units do not meet the minimum housing requirements, so, so legally speaking, people living in these micro units are considered legally as um, people experiencing homelessness in Korea. So, and also, uh, you know, almost half of folks who, who, who live in the micro units have previously, um, you know, have experience of sleeping rough or, or living in homeless shelters. And as you can imagine, obviously you can, that people living in these micro units are extremely vulnerable to extreme weather. Uh, so so for, for my research, I did a, an ethnographic research where I actually lived in one of these micro units for one year and worked with the community members. You know, for, for me, I wanted to, you know, better understand, you know, the, the lived experiences and see how folks deal with extreme weather. And, and living in these rooms, you know, being close to working with the community members was really important because, especially because my topic was um, extreme weather, you know, that, you know, I thought it was important that the bodily engagement of experiencing the heat and the cold really helped me to, to, to better understand what the folks were going through. And, 
and for today, because of time constraints, I can't talk about everything from the research, you know, the thick description or get to the nitty gritty of the results. Um, but I want to share one thing. Um, so, so one of my main research questions that I had was, um, you know, how do these folks who live in these micro units, how do they perceive or make meaning of these extreme weather disasters? Because you know, there are, there are a flood of media reports about how people suffer every day, especially during summers and winters. But, you know, no one really talked about how, how the people are thinking about it, their lived experience. So I thought it was really important to understand this from view for their, from their perspective, who are actually going through these um, extreme weather disasters. So, you know, I had a lot of conversations with community members about how they thought about extreme weather and how they responded to it. And as I mentioned, you know, the Korean media, like every summer or winter, the media is flooded with all these coverages on like extreme weather, how much people are suffering, like, like this article here. And particularly this article really stood out, caught my attention because I actually um, had interviewed the general, gen gentleman um, here in the picture. So this person, Mr. Kim, um, I recognized him like as, as soon as I saw the article, I recognized him because I, I interviewed him exactly a month ago uh, when I was living there. And I was sitting in that room, in his room, um, sitting on his pink blanket as I asked him the questions about extreme weather and how he navigated these challenges, you know, similar to the news article. And as you can see, assume from the picture uh, used by the report, like the, the article, the, the, it really emphasizes the sufferings of, you know, the residents. They only highlighted the vulnerability in terms of, you know, their poor living environmental conditions and, and the biophysical impact of the heat. And also, as you can probably see from, from this top down angle, the residents were really kind of, I thought, objectified and portrayed as just helpless victims. However, unlike this uh, article, uh, when I actually interviewed him, he had a slightly a different take. So, so what was really different was that he mostly seemed unbothered by extreme heat. So as you can see from the, the interview, the transcript, like I, I, I was just first going in, I expected to hear stories about how, how much, how hard it was to, to search conditions, you know, how much they were suffering. So, but, but rather than, um, you know, rather than that, what they shared was the opposite of what I expected. As you can see from the interview, when I asked him, you know, this question, um, um, if, you know, extreme weather affected his day-to-day -day life, his answer was not really. And rather he said, you know, people like us, we just carry on and live day-to-day. -day. And, and there was a lot to unpack there, I think. But the most salient point for me was that the, he seemed really unbothered by the heat. And throughout the interview, he didn't really have much to say about extreme weather. It obviously bothered him, you know, when it was too cold or too hot. But the same way it bothered anybody, it was just a nuisance. And at first, I just couldn't understand why, because I was asking him these questions, like, as I'm asking these questions, like, I was sweating. Um, but as I talked to more people, but I realized that this was more of a pattern. Um, it wasn't just Mr. Kim. And so another, you know, just I want to highlight this transcript um, interview was, you know, with Mr. Shin, who, also, who actually lived in the same building as I did. And, and for, so he not only seemed unbothered, but he actually said, you know, it's not too, it's not that bad, actually. And if he holds still and not move, it's actually pretty cool because he can feel the breeze. You know, like this picture, he was showing me how if he had just opened the door slightly, you know, and with a fan on, it was pretty cool. And this was a bit of a shock because when I was like, same, same, I was asking the questions in his room, I was sweating because of the humidity. And, and, and this was a recurring theme that most people, you know, at least on the surface, did not think of um, extreme weather as a disaster. And they say they were not really bothered by this. And I just couldn't make sense of why. So, so from then on, like I share this finding with, with you know, the folks that, I, that, that were in the community. And one of my main um, like informants, uh, so a friend that I, that I had made uh, who lived in the community, and his response was the following. Um, so he said, all year round, all four seasons is filled with this stress. So to every day is a disaster. You know, when every day is like that, when every day is a disaster, it's not like summer or winter suddenly becomes harder, right? And, and that every day is a disaster was such a powerful quote for me that I was immediately able to understand that, that pattern of why people seemed unbothered by extreme weather. It was because that their everyday life is like a disaster that they have become kind of numb to these risks. 
And, and so like this famous meme, um, even though extreme weather was a disaster, because you know, people were dying, you know, having heat strokes, which actually I experienced it firsthand myself. So when I was one night when I was living there, um, I was actually listening to an online lecture. So I was in my room, um, the door closed for like two hours. And after that, I came out, I feel like something was wrong, like, okay with my body. So, and I ended up like throwing up. I had to go to like one of these shelters um, just, just to cool off. So it is really a disaster that people are actually experiencing. Um, but despite all of this, it was not perceived as a disaster for these folks. And because their lives were, I think, so overwhelmed with these everyday disasters and that there was a sense of normalcy around disasters. And I think that finding um, this everyday disaster is important because when we under try to understand the vulnerability for, for folks who are experiencing homelessness, it shows that when we think about you know, climate change, extreme weather or disasters, we tend to focus on the biophysical aspect only. You know, for example, if it's too cold, how cold is it? You know, if it's too hot, what's the temperature? If it rained, how much did it rain? And I'm not saying these are not important because these are the triggers. Uh, but what the finding, the finding reveals is that, you know, we, we need to focus on this everyday disasters, everyday vulnerabilities, which are the root causes of why extreme weather becomes a disaster. Um, yeah, so, so, so that, that brings to the question of then what is the role of social work? So as I mentioned, I, I also work with you know, social work agencies and community organizing groups that are on the ground working with these folks in the neighborhood. Um, and I wanna talk about, briefly talk about the role of social work by, by comparing these two pictures uh, because it, I think it highlights the two different approaches or the ways of approaching this problem. So, so to give you a more context, the picture on the left is a picture of this government social work agency uh, where licensed social workers in Korea work. And one of the main jobs here for social workers is to basically hand out kits, you know, material aid kits, you know, that has like food and clothing. And, and, and many private companies, you know, come and do their charity volunteering, you know, charity events here, you know, for like big companies like Samsung, you know, one of the Korea's largest companies or like Hyundai, the car maker, was are also major companies. Companies, these groups, these companies come into the neighborhood, come do their, you know, do um, and provide material aid kits, you know, especially during winters and summers. And, and so the main job for social workers is to coordinate these efforts. Um, you know, they receive donations, promote these one day events. And, and, and this picture here is a picture of one where the Korea's Energy Foundation came to hand out a few hundred, you know, summer heat wave survival kits that had, you know, some instant noodles, instant like rice um, and like some underwear for folks, stuff like that. And, and the day uh, was the was actually the hottest day of the year, um, which was in August. And on the same day is the picture that I took on the right. Um, is, so the picture on the right is a soup kitchen that is run by the grassroots community groups. So here, a group of local community members volunteer to, to, to cook um, this um, chicken soup that which, you know, in Korea, traditionally people eat during the hottest day of the year. And community members cook, you know, together and they sold this lunch, um, like lunchbox for, for like a $1. And, and while I think these two events, you know, these two pictures efforts are important, I think, and has both has its purpose, but I do think that the second one is, it focuses more on the, the everyday vulnerability of, of the folks who are living in these micro units. Um, you know, these soup kitchens are just beyond, you know, selling a $1 meal. It's actually organized by community members. They're the ones who have, that are, they, they, that decide to sell it rather than provide free food because they thought it was really important for, for their neighbors to have this sense of pride and sense of ownership rather than becoming, you know, nothing but welfare recipients. And they're also the ones who are planning the menu, cooking together. And I think the soup kitchen is a pla place or a platform where people can, you know, come together and talk about their everyday life together. It is a place where people, you know, share information, which people where, where people are connected. And I do think, um, you know, this is a place where people build resiliency. And compared to this effort, um, the social work, uh, the workers for, for the government agencies, I think these like one day events, I don't know, I think, you know, one time events where people are handing out, you know, basically gives, I think it's it, there's a strong contest. So I would like to call this more of like a disposable social work, where where the focus is on the on on the social workers themselves rather than the people who are experiencing um, you know extreme weather. 
and also, you know, the decisions are made um, by social workers. You know, it, it also follows the, the company's agenda, you know, that's doing the charity work. So I think like this kind of effort does take away the, the agency of community members. So, and they basically, you know, become like a photo, photo prop. So, um, you know, connecting this to the previous finding of the everyday disaster, I think the implication is clear while providing, you know, material aid, help kits in summer and winter is important, but at the same time, you know, I think in a way it's, it's a little reactive and short-sighted. And I think we need to uh, think about ways to build that resiliency of the people, you know, that long-term approach focusing on the everyday vulnerabilities. And um, yeah, so yeah, so I think this, this, the research that I shared is an example that, that showed the connection between climate justice and homelessness. So again, I, I like to end um, today's, you know, talk by reiterating what Dr. Uh, Mason said, who said, you know, social work needs to, to connect the dots uh, for how climate change intersects with a range of areas of work. You know, we need to engage in dialogues across different differences to build their alliance, which I think the, the theme of this year's conference was particularly fitting um, because the work that we all do, I think is important in ways that, you know, it's all connected, uh, whether that's addressing homelessness, climate justice, and, and like the work, you know, my dog is my home is doing. I think we all need to focus on finding common ground to solve the social injustices and, and tackle it from, from multiple fronts. Um, so, so again, I want to reiterate the theme of the conference because I think we, we you know, re rewarding it. So, so I think we really will be stronger together if you build that allyship. So thank you all for listening. Um, and if you have any questions, I can either answer it now or wait till the end. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing a very needed lens to this work. Uh, our last presenter is Dr. Daniel Bryson, uh, professor and director of the Center for Housing and Homelessness Research at the Graduate School of Social Work at University of Denver. Dr. Bryson's scholarship focuses on poverty, high poverty neighborhoods, affordable housing, and homelessness. Uh, he has an ongoing community partnerships around Colorado and the country with several uh, with social service providers and other stakeholders interested in addressing challenges related to poverty. He's written extensive uh, extensively on the role of neighborhood uh, social social cohesion as a mediator for the health and well-being of families living in high poverty neighborhoods. Currently, Dr. Brisson is focusing on community partnerships with affordable housing providers and guaranteed basic income programs. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, please begin when you're ready. Thanks so much. <clears throat> and thanks for bringing up my slides. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, Carol. Thanks um, to my dog is my home. Uh, it's really a pleasure to um, be able to, to share some of what I know uh, with the audience here. Um, to give you some context, just a little bit about myself, I am a faculty member at the Graduate School of Social Work at the University of Denver. I'm also the director for the Center for Housing and Homelessness Research. Um, right now, as was said in the nice introduction, um, one of our main projects is looking at um, basic income or guaranteed income as a means to address um, poverty housing insecurity and homelessness. We have another project specifically um, addressing homelessness. It's called Trauma-Informed Design, thinking about how um, design, building design, brick and mortar um, uh, intersects with a traumatic experience of someone who was previously living on the street and how uh, housing can facilitate health or um, Sloan, thank you. I'm sorry, I shouldn't be reading the, the chat right now, but uh, I, I, maybe I will a little. Um, thank you, Meg. <laughs> I need to turn off that chat so I don't get too distracted. Um, yeah, so how, how um, design is important for healing or health or how it might in fact impede healing and health uh, and re-trigger past trauma. Um, so that's some of the work we're doing right now with the Center for Housing and Homelessness Research. But in this talk, I'm going to talk about um, other innovations. We do a lot of innovative work at the Center for Housing and Homelessness Research. And where I'm eventually going to get to are two innovations that we've studied. One, 
uh, looking at tiny homes for people experiencing homelessness and another looking at safe parking for people experiencing homelessness. So if we can see that next slide. Um, so just to frame this up, uh, you, you, I'm guessing many of you know at least parts of this. I'll, 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 I'll talk nationally and where I live in Denver, the metropolitan area here. Um, but when I first got into uh, thinking about studying, I'm, I'm a social scientist, right? Uh, I saw some comments in the chat earlier. How does this, how does this work for people on the ground? And listening to Roger's uh, talk and wow, it was so moving. Your book, Roger, is incredible. Um, I, I wanted to be an artist at that moment rather than a social scientist. Uh, but, but I'm a social scientist and that's my contribution to thinking about housing insecurity and homelessness. And what we do is we, we think deeply about the particular issue and, and try to um, set some frame or context for, for why it's an issue. Um, and, and what we know is that for people experiencing homelessness, there's simply not enough housing about, um, we know that there's about one affordable home for every four people that need it. So three out of every four people who don't have enough money to afford housing don't get any support. Um, I refer to this often as the current housing crisis. Um, wherever you are listening from and around the country, around the world, um, I'll just talk about the country because frankly, I don't know about the world, but around the country, the housing crisis is everywhere. Here in Denver, uh, I believe the median home price is something like $550,000, just an absurd amount of money for someone to actually own a home and rental prices um, just as bad. You can see here on my slide, uh, this is this is the national housing wage, but uh, a housing wage is, is um, what it what you need to earn to spend a third or less of your income. A third of your income on housing is typically considered the standard for um, being able to afford that home. So, um, for nationally around the country, you need to earn about twenty five dollars per hour in in your work to be able to pay for a two bedroom home. That's considerably higher than uh, I believe the $15 an hour federal minimum wage. Um, housing just simply isn't affordable. Um, and, and that's the issue, right? There's not enough housing. Housing isn't affordable. A and that leads to this issue that you all have been discussing the last two days, now the third day. Uh, that leads to homelessness. It's it's not that hard of an equation to figure out. If there's a pool of homes, right, and there's a population of people, and we try to squeeze the population of people into the pool of homes, but there's not enough homes, at the bottom, people are left without homes and experiencing homelessness. And in the Denver metro area, um, the estimates, the point in time count, estimates there's about 6,000 people experiencing homelessness, which we know is definitely uh, an undercount I like to use. I, I don't know who I need to credit this to, but this notion that there are at least from the pit, it's a minimum number of people experiencing homelessness. So at least about 6,000 people experiencing homelessness. If we can go to the next slide, that would be great. So I think we went just one too far. Yep, thank you. Um, so what I've seen in my work, I've been the director of the Center for Housing and Homelessness Research for about five years now. And what I saw and what kind of guided the direction I'm taking the center towards innovation is that um, this housing crisis, this, these increases that we saw from Ben's slides in homelessness have pulled lots of attention from varied sectors, from people who were formerly not interested in homelessness, um, entrepreneurs, tech sector folks, right? I, it, you know, three and four years ago, I saw all sorts of apps coming out showing where there's locations for uh, beds for people experiencing homelessness. Uh, hospitals are recognizing that um, uh, dismissing patients who need care into an experience of homelessness will just bring them right back into their door. People who aren't typically um, interested in the issues of housing and homelessness are coming to the field because the crisis is so serious. 
And so um, that has led our center to think about innovation. And Ben was a speaker at, at, at one of our conferences. And um, I, I wanna say this, um, not necessarily carefully, but at least clearly, the traditional approaches to address housing insecurity and homelessness, um, while good for some portion of the population, are not complete. Maybe in statistical language, we would say that's um, necessary, but not sufficient, right? The, the existing solutions are necessary, but they're not sufficient. They're not fully addressing um, the full issue of homelessness. And importantly, and I think I heard this in um, June Mo's talk right then, one of the things I think we need to do, and one of the things I think people in this conference are probably really good at doing, is listening to the people who have the experience of homelessness or housing insecurity about um, what the issues they're facing are. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, and one of the issues that I think you all know is that many people, and again, Roger's great illustrations, many people experiencing homelessness, I heard Ben say about 10% of those who are unsheltered have a companion animal, right? And so a shelter system, uh, a shelter system that, it, uh, I mean, I don't know how to say it, it is typically not the most companion animal friendly. It's not friendly for lots of people. I've heard it's not friendly for people identifying as LGBTQ. Uh, I've heard from um, mothers, families, many, many shelters are not um, th the greatest space for them to bring their families. Um, shelters are okay, and some shelters, right? There's a, a range of type of shelters. But maybe we need to think about innovations. Maybe we need to think about different solutions, solutions that that people experiencing homelessness say, yeah, that would work for me. And so I have had the great pleasure of working with two different groups, um, the Colorado Village Collaborative in Denver, who built um, Denver's first tiny home community, the beloved community village, and, and have a, a number of um, spaces for people who were experiencing homelessness available. And then I've also worked with the Colorado Safe Parking Initiative, another great organization building a, a group of partners around the city and around the state, providing uh, safe places for people to park and shelter in their homes. So if we can go to the next slide, um, right, interestingly, and, and maybe it, this is fool, it is, it is a little silly of me. We studied Denver's first tiny home village, the beloved community village, which provided, I believe, 13 tiny homes, about 400 square feet for people experiencing homelessness. And we started this evaluation, I think, in 2017. And what I was going to say there is, um, foolishly, I was surprised that I believe four of the 13 folks who moved into Denver's tiny home village for people experiencing homelessness had companion animals. One person uh, was in love with their mice. Another person had a bird. Another person had a snake. Uh, another person had a dog, right? Um, and people who, who were admitted into the beloved community village were admitted there because the sheltering options for them just weren't a good fit, right? So my organization, again, I'm a social scientist. Um, I, I, I got to study, I got to think through, think about what the impact of tiny homes are for people experiencing homelessness. And what we found was really positive. I wrote in a, a, a report that it's hard to look at the compilation of results that we put together about the individual impact on people experiencing homelessness, the community or neighborhood impact, uh, what impact did tiny homes have on the neighborhood, um, and uh, the safety. Uh, we looked at crime statistics and look at, looked at safety in the surrounding community. And all of those pointed to a pretty clear message, triangulating those results pointed to a pretty clear message that tiny homes were a successful innovation for people experiencing homelessness. Um, I guess some of the standout results from that work were that um, people who were experiencing homelessness, but then were admitted into, um, who, who took up residence in the beloved community village uh, had 
substantially improved labor and uh, school attachment. So they all got jobs or, or were enrolled in school. Um, and then an important message back in 2017, 2018, when this was the first village, the first, um, the first effort of its kind in Denver and facing lots of NIMBY, not in my backyard sentiment, was that um, the village had little to no impact on the surrounding neighborhood. People's responses about their perception of the neighborhood was that people were very clean. Uh, I don't even, I didn't even know it existed. I'm so glad to have it there versus the vacant lot that used to be there. Um, so people were either neutral or very positive about uh, the tiny home village. So my message here, innovations to address homelessness, right? So people have companion animals. We saw Rogers, uh, I, I don't mean this to be like overly glazing. I loved Rogers presentation in his book, just as I saw lots of people in the chat, right? Um, people experiencing homelessness are our neighbors, our community members experiencing homelessness. With their, with their companion animals might need an innovation like tiny homes. Um, and if we can go to the next slide. And another innovation that I got the pleasure of studying with the Colorado Safe Parking Initiative was safe parking. And again, these are, these are strategies that we're finding out not because I'm a brilliant academic, I, I, you know, and I saw some of this in the chat, but what are people on the ground saying? What, what's happening organically? And organically, because of the housing crisis, people are sleeping in their cars. Um, this isn't new, right? I had friends when I was 21 or 22 years old who, who had short stays in their cars because of gaps in their housing, right? Uh, but with the increase in homelessness and uh, with the increase in the housing affordability crisis, uh, we see an increase in homelessness and we do see an increase in people sheltering in their cars. And again, this is a solution that people are choosing over shelters. Uh, and one of the things we are hearing, um, I'm not saying that every shelter is unsafe. Shelters are a, a, a very necessary solution. But um, people told us when they came to the safe parking lot, one of the reasons I wanna be here is because I don't feel safe in a shelter system. And in fact, after staying in the safe parking lot and leaving, to a housing option, 50% of the people that uh, we talked to that were leaving a safe parking situation uh, reported they were moving to a more permanent or stable housing situation. Um, and they did feel that they increased their safety. Um, but again, safe parking, living in your own vehicle is a place that, um, that is amenable to uh, people who have companion animals, people with mice or a bird, um, people with a dog, uh, who, who their pet, their companion animal is their home, is their life, is their family. Um, so we'll go to the last slide. I think I am just about at our session's time and I know there's lots of interesting uh, questions and questions for all the panelists to discuss. Um, and I'm sorry about the typos here on this last slide, but. Just in conclusion, uh, as I see it, as my center has worked through this, um, we, are, we are experiencing a housing crisis. And I, I, I imagine that in 10 and 20 and 40 years from now, housing around the country is going to look different. And uh, in my experience as the director of the center, more and more municipalities are saying, and it's because of the visible homelessness, not necessarily because of the scope, um, which I don't, I, 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 I don't fully have the time to get into right now, but because of the increase in visibility of homelessness, people are now addressing this issue. Entrepreneurs, tech sector folks, hospitals, we need innovation to address homelessness. And that innovation needs to start where the people who are experiencing the issue, where they're finding their own solutions. I, I Again, the, um, the sheltering options in Korea and, um, and what people are saying about it, I think tells us something about people themselves and, and what they need for shelter. So I hope that wasn't too rambled. I hope it uh, connected to what you are interested in. And um, I'm really happy to answer questions and, and uh, just glad to be a part of this panel. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was perfect. Um, 
Uh, thank you. And thank you to all three of our presenters. There was so much great information presented. Um, I was monitoring the chat. I'm sure folks have a lot of questions, so we're going to get through them. So we're going to do um, Q&A for a little bit. Uh, Christine is back joining me. Um, so if you have any questions or comments you'd like to make, um, you know, drop them in the chat. Um, so Christine, I'm going to let you get us started off with some questions. Uh, make sure, sure. Our are all on screen. Yep. Perfect. Great. Great. So we have a, we do have a lot of interesting questions in the chat, and I'm going to give people another minute to drop in their thoughts here. Um, but we are going to start off with a question from my dog is my home. Uh, so at this conference, we focused on three distinct kinds of leadership in our keynote panels, policy leaders, proximate leaders and advocates, uh, excuse me, proximate leaders and advocates and academics. And the other two fields, um, galvanizing for change is rhetoric that seems more used and more familiar. I'm not sure if this is fair, and um, of course, speakers feel free to weigh in, um, but galvanizing isn't exactly a word that comes to mind when I think about the research world or the ac academic world, with perhaps the exception of the field of social work because of the nature of what this field is. Social workers work on uh, social problems that affect people. The social work grand challenges are what seem to be an academic product, although I think Dr. Henwood, what you were saying or what I was hearing in your talk is that it's actually not supposed to be that, like it's, um, it's a little bit more decentralized or it can be. Um, so I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, do you feel that the grand challenges has actually galvanized the field of social work has it mobilized the field to solve social problems? And where has it been successful and where can there be improvements? Sorry, that's sort of a long, complex question. No, I, I, I think it's a great question. I think your, your framing, of, framing of the question is, um, is um, you know, well, well taken in the sense that, right, I, the grand challenge is it did come from the American Academy of Social Work and Social Wel Welfare, which is, which is really, you know, academically oriented. I think, obviously, there are inherent, you know, problems with that when most of the work, right, is done on the ground. Um, and so this isn't really a ground up initiative. I think part of it was really for schools of social work. And one of the one of the things that at least I've seen is that uh, e even though homelessness is kind of a, you know, a, a central issue for social workers, we don't always see that many of our graduates wanting to go into the space. And, and, you know, I, I could speculate as to, as to why, why that is, um, and, and on other, others can too, but I think par part of what the grand challenges was supposed to do, and part of what some of our programming um, at our school is doing is to try to really just to try to get people excited um, in the sense that letting them know, like, if you want to do really good clinical work, you know, you can do that in homeless services. And if you want to do, you know, if you want to focus on policy, you know, there's, there's no area of policy that homelessness doesn't touch. And so I think, I think just being able to message that so that students are more excited about entering the space is, to me, a pretty important thing. And I do think that um, the, the, the one thing that is clear is that the grand challenges ha has helped um, schools, you know, focus in on, on the topic and on the curriculum in particular. And so, you know, I think I just mentioned we've, we've seen the development of, of more field placements because, because of these grand challenges and, and the focus on that. Um, so I think that's a, that's a takeaway as to like the other sort of like tangible impact that's had, you know, I, I do think that that's largely at a, at a research level. Um, and, you know, some of these policy efforts that really are, were built on existing efforts, you know, obviously we didn't make up the idea of ending homelessness. There's plenty of work that's going on. So it was really partnerships with other places. So anyway, but to your, your last point is right. I think, I think we're more than happy for people to use this. If this is something that's going to excite others to be part of, then then that's great, you know, and, and they, they can by all means do that. Great, that brings me to a different question then. So one of the Grand Challenges foundational papers is called Social is Fundamental. Um, and there's a really strong case made in that foundational paper about interdisciplinary work um, and one of, uh, you know, a, a proverb is quoted in 
that paper. If you want to go, if you want to travel fast, go alone. But if you want to travel far, go together. So today you have a whole group of people who you might have previously thought were an unlikely ally in ending homelessness. You have animal advocates here. So how can we marry animal welfare and social work? Is there room for animal issues in our understanding of the social work brand challenges? I can speak on to that for a little bit. Um, so for, for this new emerging field of what's called eco-social work, I think it, it's critical of the, how the, the foundation of social work, which is person and environment, which, you know, person and environment, you know, but then when they, when they talk about environment, it's mostly was social environment. So it didn't really take into account of the natural environment. Um, so there are emerging uh, scholars who are talking about, okay, we need to, reorient ourselves, you know, think about the new paradigm of what does it mean to um, include the natural environment? And I think that includes a relationship with the animals um, of, you know, we're not, you know, thinking about how we're just a part of the natural environment, not just like we're not the owners, you know, we're not the, you know, we don't own, you know, we're not better than, you know, and that an anthropocentric um, perspective of the, the social work, I think, you know, people are starting to criticize that. So I think that's where the animal welfare can, and all, also the social work can kind of merge. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. So there's a question in the chat um, that is specifically for Dr. Daniel Brisson. Um, there's a question about tiny homes in here, which I just lost track of. Yeah, I'm trying. I was trying to find that one too. Was was you looking at the one related to NIMBY? No, I just found it here. Okay. Um, it's from Vicki Ramirez from the Center for One Health Research. Uh, she says the argument in Seattle is that transition out of tiny homes into a more permanent housing situation isn't happening, and people are spending years in tiny houses where it is supposed to be an intermediate solution. Did you look at this in Denver? Hmm. It's an interesting question. Um, no, we didn't look at the transition out. And, and, but but there, I have lots of related information, which is um, the tiny homes in Denver, when, when they started defining them in terms of the current uh, sheltering and housing system was complex. They didn't want to be called a shelter. They didn't want to be called permanent housing. They weren't sure what they wanted to be. And so when Seattle is saying, or when someone in Seattle is saying, this is like a, a transitional housing option, this is an option to, to go from homelessness to temporarily housed into permanent housing, I, I think that's a giant issue, right? Um, and, and frankly, it perplexes me. I would love to hear what Ben has to say about it, right? Um, be, because we do know, we do have some research that says that transitional housing may not produce fantastic outcomes, um, that permanent supportive housing does produce positive outcomes. Um, but really, it just on, on face validity, right, getting someone, um, someone moving out of foster care, someone um, leaving, leaving a prison situation into some temporary housing until they can get permanent just seems to make sense. And when I've talked to providers, they said it makes sense too, but I do not have a great answer for how we get people from transitional housing into permanent housing. And, and if I could pass it on to Ben, if he does have any insights. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm happy to try, try to feel that one. I mean, I think, you know, I, I think, I think that the trick is obviously, you know, when you create a system and I think that was always the problem with like the way the shelter system was created. If you don't, you know, create those permanent, um, you know, paths out of homelessness, then, uh, you know, you're, you're leaving people stuck in, in a precarious situation. So yeah, by all means, I think, I think creating transitional housing could, could work as long as you're keeping pace with, um, you know, as a temporary place. But, you know, I think the, the other way to think about it too, is that uh, obviously anytime, we, we know that transitions are, you know, um, result in, you know, just, just higher risk across the board for a lot of things. And so the, 
the, the more quickly you can get someone to a, a permanent stable location, the better off you are. And so, you know, obviously if you could, if you could build a system that could respond that way, that's great. I think what, what politicians and others are struck with is that's not a quick system to build and what do you do in the meantime? So I think tiny homes has kind of come up as a, you know, the next best thing, but it's, it's difficult. I think when you think about it holistically, yeah. Um, so I know that uh, you've mentioned, Dr. Henwood, um, about how the uh, policy proposal for the 2020 presidential election, you know, was great, and then the pandemic hit. Uh, so is there any any of the proposals in there, the essays that were written um, that you would want to highlight or something that maybe if it hadn't been for the pandemic, um, maybe could have been like this really great innovative idea at a national sort of political level or examples of things that are happening that went sort of from theory and research to execution in a certain community? Yeah, I mean, I can I can share those proposals. I don't think that there was sort of any direct translation of this the specific you know proposals that were put in there. What it what it did do, I think, is engage. Um, you know, we had we had some local politicians who uh, requested meetings on uh, j just to go over those proposals, including Karen Bass, like locally here in LA. I think it also helped just in terms of you know, our, the NASW does do a lot of advocacy work on Capitol Hill. And I think this just kind of helped focus and align the work that they were doing with what, you know, the national low income um, uh, group is doing and the national alliance that, and homelessness. So I think it helped spurred some conversation and helped align uh, a few different groups but I, I can't speak to any single proposal. If you take a look at them, some of them were population specific. So we had a couple on older adult homelessness. We had one on youth homelessness, uh, one about just the underlying, underlying racism and needing you know, a racial equity lens. So these are all things I think that, that are out there anyway. Um, it was just sort of framed in a way for a presidential campaign to kind of focus in on it and, you know, it, it had some success, at least in getting people, um, you know, to pay pay more attention to it. Thank you. Uh, Christine, do you, you want to take one more? Sure, we have time for one more. Um, this is from Anne English. We talk a lot about intersectionality with respect to personal demographics, but the understanding of how all of our social issues are intertwined is less well known, understood, and addressed. When we talk about connecting the dots, how do we address these silos and fragmentation even within the same sector? Yes, are you just allowed to answer a question with that? <laughs> and leave it to smarter people than me. Can you repeat the question, <laughs> sorry? Sure, we talk a lot about intersection uh, intersectionality with respect to personal demographics, but the understanding of how all of our social issues are intertwined is less well known, understood, and addressed. When we talk about connecting the dots, how do we address these silos and fragmentation even within the same sector? I mean, I think it, like a conference like this is also a start too, where it brings a lot of people together and also not just in terms of the same field, but also like the field and the underground and also the academia too. Like being in academia, sometimes you feel like you're all, <laughs> you're all stuck there alone. Um, so I think it's, you know, I think both sides need to do a better job of, I guess, like listening to each other and also, um, yeah. So I think, I mean, like a platform like this, which I really appreciate it. So, um, more initiatives like this, I think is definitely important and needed. Anyone else want to add anything? No pressure. <laughs> uh, uh, is, this, is this a comment? I feel like I read this comment earlier. Maybe did Anne English put this up? If, if yeah. I'm, if I'm, if I'm, <laughs> can yeah, I, no. can I? Yeah, go ahead. Can I just jump in really fast? Well, all I'm saying is, you know, there's so much fragmentation even within the housing and homeless services sector, right? So trying to get all of our different, you know, um, issue areas together, I'm just looking for, you know, some kinds of, you know, thoughts around bringing people together um, since, you know, we seem to have challenges even within our own sectors. That's what I was saying. Yeah. 
I, I think that's a, a great point. And honestly, even with the grand challenges, I sort of struggled with like, you know, is homelessness the best way to frame these issues when we know that really, you know, homelessness is kind of the end point for a lot of people because of a lot of other issues. And and maybe we do a disservice when we kind of focus on on homelessness as the as the issue when we know inequity and racism and all these other uh, factors are really what, what needs to be addressed. And so I think that's the that's just the the larger problem of you know really needing to go a little bit more upstream in all of this and making you know affordable housing available to right. everyone. But that's you know politically not a conversation that people like to have. So I I think we do struggle then when we're when you know the homeless service sector is expected to figure out how to right all the wrongs of the. <laughs> So right. these other areas. Yeah. So it's a challenging one for sure. Well, thank you for trying to tackle that. Uh, but totally agree with you. Um, this has been super enlightening, um, but we're at the end of our Q&A. Um, I want to thank our panelists, Dr. Henwood, June Mo, Dr. Brisson. Each of you is doing such important work and it's an honor to have you participate at My Dog is My Home's conference. Um, and thank you to our audience. Uh, the chat has been wild um, and we'll have transcripts and um, you know we're having these conversations and that's what's important. So we are going to take a quick break. It's going to be a little under 25 minutes, um, but go grab some coffee, rest your mind, rest your eyes, um, whatever. We're going to meet back at the Zoom uh, at the Zoom at 2.15 um, Eastern time. So um, I have 154 on my clock, so uh, 215, uh, we will come back here and then we're going to break out into sessions. Thank you so much to our panelists and to our wonderful audience. See you soon. Thank you all.